Hey guys, so today I wanted to talk about repropagating your property with edible perennials in a cold climate without um, spending a whole lot of money. Now, everything that I planted that was wild craftable, that was non-grafted, that is supposed to be self-seeding and, and spreading and that kind of thing, I got most of it from Coldstream Farm. I think it's coldstreamfarm.net is the website. And I, to a lesser degree, I got some of it from Musser. <clears throat> and I found that the quality of the Coldstream Farm was far superior and the price wasn't higher. Most of the trees that I got were like $1.49 a piece. They came with really good root systems. They were just really great quality. Our first order when we got here was from Rain Tree, and Rain Tree was really good. Um, they had a lot that were like specialized varieties of a certain kind of wild crafting plant. So they would have aronia berries with an actual name attached to them rather than just them being seedlings that were anybody's guess is who, how good they are. Um, and I'm not sure how much of a difference that made. It could have made a difference because a lot of our fruit is exceptionally tasty and exceptionally sweet for that variety, for that kind of plant. Uh, for instance, the erroneas, they're called, they're called choke berries for a reason. And yet, once they're black, they taste scrumptious, they're sweet, they're delicious. The same thing goes for our service berries. They, they taste slightly like apricots and blueberry mixed together. They're very, very tasty. Same thing goes for our nanking cherries. They're exceptionally sweet. Um, and so I think it does make a difference where you get them from. However, when you're first starting out, in my opinion, the cheaper the better as long as they're high quality. And Rain Tree was exceptionally more expensive than Coldstream Farm. So I really like Coldstream Farm. So I wanted to go through all the different varieties of fruiting and um, edible plants that we have put on the property. We started this four years ago and it has been quite the journey to figure out what will and what won't grow here easily. Some things you can force to grow here, but they won't ever bear. And, and that kind of makes a difference. It, you know, if you're really wanting to put in exotics, you have to recognize you might not ever get any kind of yield from them. It might just have been the joy and the success of having grown this thing. Some of uh, my examples would be like mulberries. We do have mulberry trees all over our property. And we have some peaches. And did we have anything else? Um, I think those are the two that really survived and thrived. However, fruiting them is very difficult. The mulberries have yet to ever fruit. They've tried to, but then we always have, but they, they try to blossom early in the year when we still have quite a lot of frost. And so that obviously didn't work out. Uh, they're tenacious though. They're extremely tenacious because the frost actually killed all their leaves and they relieved out after that. And so they, they're, they're, uh, they're drought hardy and they're beautiful trees. And so you know, we'll never have mulberries, but we do have some beautiful mulberry trees. Um, I will try to stay on topic as I list off all the trees that we have put in. And they have been inexpensive. A um, couple hundred trees for $50 inexpensive. Okay, so I'll start with our grafted trees. We have uh, three different varieties of apples that are all dwarfing varieties or semi-dwarfing. In the future, I would not do dwarfing. I would do standard trees. The reason for this is that the dwarfing varieties don't put a ton of fruit on. Yeah, you can reach them easily, but they don't put a ton of fruit on and they don't give a huge amount of shade. Um, I, I guess that's probably a good thing because I planted them in the backyard, which already I've already filled with other trees. Uh, and so they won't be casting a shadow over anything, but they're not putting on a lot of fruit. And so I'm not sure that I see the point of having them be so small. Um, they add a little bit of texture to the backyard, but their overall contribution is very small. I have, uh, pear trees 
that have standardized and they're gorgeous and they put on so much fruit and I absolutely adore them. Um, again, I think I would, I would definitely recommend going standard. The, the standard trees that I purchased, which were the pears, have just been much less finicky about their conditions and had a lot fewer pests than apples, but that could just be our area. We don't have a lot of pear trees in the area, so we don't have a lot of pear pests in the area. We don't get any bugs in our pears. We do get some bugs in our apples. We have Nanking cherry bushes, and they are delicious and wonderful and beautiful. They are a highlight of our homestead, and I've planted... Um, there were, some, there were some here when we moved here, and I've planted several more rows in different places, and they have been extremely successful in our dry alkaline soil. They have put on fruit every year as long as they don't blossom before the bees can get out to them, and then they're just loaded with fruit up through September. So they start putting on fruit in June. So they're, they're fantastic. We have filberts, uh, hazelnuts, witch hazel, aronia berry and what else have i put in that is edible uh ginkgo biloba little leaf linden little leaf linden is supposed to put on tea uh, leaves that you can use in tea we have the crab apple but that was here before we got here we have blackberry canes raspberry canes we had to replant all the raspberries many many times i've planted hundreds of raspberry canes and what it came down to in the end was I needed to find a spot where I could just dump rabbit manure and dump water until I could get them to develop some good root systems so that they would just spread on their own. So that's what I did. I took some, I took several small patches where I knew I was going to be putting a lot of water and that's where I put the canes and yes, now they have spread and they're happy. <clears throat> Lots of strawberries. I like seascape. And anywhere that I have lots and lots of fruit, I and lots of water and lots of, of manure, rabbit manure, I plant garlic so that I have perennial patches of garlic to pull seed heads from, and that works really well for me. It, also in all those spaces, I have lots of comfrey, lots of mint. Um, I try just to pack in as much stuff in there because the more good plants I have in there, the fewer weeds I have that invade. Let's see, what else do I have? Um, up in the front, we have lots and lots of service berry. Lots of service berry, honey berry, the cold hardy sweet-ish cherries. I got those from Honey Berry USA, the honey berries, and also the, um, the, like the Carmine Jewel cherries and the Romeo cherries and that kind of thing. And then along the sides, I have Hedge Cotton Easter and Autumn Olive. Both of those have done well. The Hedge Cotton Easter has done better than the Autumn Olive. It seems to be a little bit hardier. It has been very difficult to get these windbreak type trees to really thrive and survive. Um, I know that a lot of people say that they are uh, invasive and that they spread. On my property they are not invasive and they do not spread. It is difficult to keep them alive. However, the more mulch I put down, the more manure I put down, the more geese and ducks that I have grazing around those trees, the better they do. And as long as they're still alive, eventually they will get big and strong and beautiful. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We have a couple hackberries. The hackberries and the black locusts have struggled in our area because they don't like the cold. Um, they have come back every time, but it's like they're just pulling everything they have out of their roots just to leaf out first thing in the year. And so they die back. They have die back every single year. They turn black. And then it takes them a really long time to get leafed out in the summer. Like sometimes it can take them as long as the 1st of June to get some leaves on, which <clears throat> they're, they're getting there, but it you, you really have to do some babying as far as the watering and the fertilizing early in spring to give them that extra punch to come back. Um, I have lots of wormwood spread all over the, um, the property and medicinal herbs. I, again, I do the same thing with my medicinal herbs that I did with my raspberries. I picked a spot where I knew there was going to be a lot of water and I caged it off so none of the ducks or anything could get in there. And then I planted my aggressive medicinal herbs in a patch of different types and then let them go. And now, so now I have perennial patches of medicinal herbs. Uh, some of that would be lovage, cleavers, uh, bugleweed, um, 
Comfrey, of course. What else? Ella Campaign. And uh, I do, I don't know. I, I would have to, I would have to think back through some of the other things that I planted. Um, mullion. I did purposefully plant some mullion, uh, stinging nettle. So lots, lots of that kind of thing all over the place. Um, so I, I need to think for a second if I have any other thing that I've missed. Uh, lots of grapevines. Lots of grapevines. They've done really well. Um, I keep, I put rocks around their roots, big cobblestones around their roots so that the ducks could get into weed around them but couldn't dig their roots up and that has worked exceptionally well. Big heavy rocks are about the only thing you can use to keep ducks out from around the roots of trees and so I highly recommend that if you like to weed with ducks. So that is, that is what we have in the property right now and um, we had a pretty good harvest from it this year. The girls ate everything fresh. We have not canned anything. In order to have enough to do canning and, and dehydrating and stuff like that, you need not juvenile trees, but mature adult trees, and, and our trees just aren't to that point yet. But that's, <clears throat> but that's how many years it took to get everything started and mature and for us to figure out the watering system. It took four years. Five would be, in, in, my opinion, in my opinion, in my experience, it's always been five years before you get a really huge harvest and the soil starts to take care of itself a little, a little bit. Um, and so getting discouraged before your fifth year, you can't give up before your fifth year if you want to stay on your property. Um, that is the magic number in my experience, at least in our climate, because we have very dry alkaline soil. Um, the way that we've been able to get this many types of plants and be this successful is that I've, <clears throat> I've applied a lot of mulch and I started and put everything in very densely in the backyard so that I had patches of successful growing things to then spread out to those other areas. So instead of spreading things out all initially, which is what I did in the first, in the first year, is I spread everything out thinking I'd be able to get water to everything. I didn't know my system yet. And what I ended up having to do was pull everything back and get everything started in the backyard where I had a foot of deep mulch so that when things died, after I transplanted them, I always had another patch to come and harvest a little bit from and get it started again. And so having a nursery space, a place where you have good strong plant growth and good strong habitat for everything, where it's not killing you to keep it alive, everything's pretty much taking care of itself is really smart because otherwise you have to keep ordering from these nurseries and you don't want to have to order from these nurseries forever. You want to be able to harvest and cull and take things from your land that are already established. Along that line, this year with the woofers, we had them dig trenches and in those trenches we are putting all of our seed pits, everything from all of our fruit. We also put in uh, slips from willows and cottonwoods to also give a little bit of shade as the other more delicate things start to seed out. And the reason I did them in trenches is so that the water that comes from the irrigation will settle into that space and hold for a little while. Because when you start things from slips, they need a lot of water in order to get those little rootlets out and started. So this year, I didn't purchase anything from any of my catalogs. Instead, everything came from my own property, from those started little little blocks of nutrition and water and beauty that where everything was doing amazing. That's where I harvested everything from. So I hope that was helpful in your little walk around my property. A lot of people have been asking for a walk around the property. So hopefully I was able to show you some of that and we'll talk to you later and, and show okay when you're when you're harvesting siberian pea shrubs you have to look for the pods that are still closed once they open up with that kind of curly let's see if i can show you when they look curly like this all that turns into a little funnel and all the seeds come out the bottom so so it is picky work and, and earlier, there's a difference in color. I thought these weren't ready yet because they weren't brittle. They were, they're still a little bit soft. Mm -hmm. And so I thought they weren't mature enough yet. And I don't know, I don't know if they are mature enough because they're soft, but we got to pick them. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully, 
hopefully they'll mature because we want to put them in those trenches. Okay. All right, Squirt, what are you doing? Um, I just got stung by a bee, so... Christian where I don't have mulch, it doesn't go in.